everyone, this is Julia with episode number 53 of the Mixology Talk podcast. We're always asking you to send us your questions about mixology, about cocktails, about how many spoons Chris currently owns. Actually, we haven't received that question. I hope you don't ask. It's really not a healthy number. But today we're going to do another listener questions podcast. So Chris and I are going to go over as many questions as we can get through before we bore you to death. So let's get into it. So our first question is from Antonine from southwestern, Fran- excuse me, southeastern France, and he notes in his comment, it is close to the Chartreuse Distillery. I think we've talked to this guy a couple of times on Facebook. He keeps taunting you with how close he is to the Chartreuse Distillery. I remember he actually sent us pictures, like mocking the fact <laughs> that he lives so close to the Chartreuse factory. Antonine, you're killing us, and I'm killing me. I'm still again, waiting for that package to just secretly end up in the I mail. I know, I know. Then again, I'm pretty sure we're butchering the pronunciation of your name, so maybe we're even. so antonine asks hey you guys i was just wondering since i'm most of the time making drinks for at least a couple people at a time what would be the most effective way to go about making several different cocktails all at once without over diluting each other or lagging behind so you serve them all at once so i'm going to summarize that basically how do you make a bunch of different cocktails at the same time without one of them being done first and getting watered down and yucky yeah, no, this is a really great question because it's about building many different cocktails at the same time in a shortest amount of time. Yeah, you can't get away with batching in this scenario. Right. So um, it, this is a really fantastic question. And the whole idea behind this is to kind of maximize every single movement that you're doing behind the bar to build out these cocktails. So, for example, if you have a margarita, a daiquiri, a rum and coke, and let's say a Jack and Coke that every time you grab a bottle, you're going through each cocktail very deliberately. So for like the margarita and the daiquiri, they both take lime juice. So without dropping the, you know, pouring, creating one cocktail and then putting the lime juice back down and then picking it up again, you're pouring all the lime juice out at once. Same thing with the rum. You have two different rum cocktails at once, right? You have the daiquiri, you have the rum and Coke. So then you would add those two ingredients in one fell swoop, put that bottle down, Pull up the Jack. I think I said Jack and Coke. I think you did, yeah. Um, so then no, you would pull think... up the Jack, and then you would put the Coke in at the same time for the rum and Coke and the Jack and Coke. So you're maximizing so, every single possible step. So to summarize, you might do all your citrus at once, and then you might do all your spirits at once, but bundling them, uh, you know, like some light cocktails with light cocktails. Right, and ideally you're using two hands at once. So as one hand is building, you know, in one hand you have lime juice, So you're building your daiquiri, you're building your margarita with lime juice. And on the other hand, you have the rum. So you pour your rum and Coke, you pour your daiquiri at the same time Mm -hmm. with the rum. You drop those two bottles down. You pick up the tequila and the Jack. I think I said Jack. And you pour those at the same time. (laughs) So then instead of building out four different cocktails, taking 12 different movements, you've made four cocktails with four movements basically right have we done a video about this no i don't think we we should we definitely should so if you're listening to this in the distant future definitely check out the show notes we'll include a link to that video but this is definitely better explained in a video i think it's hard to describe all the movements but what you're basically talking about is just being really efficient with your movements behind the bar and this is a great skill for a bartender i think as well what antonine's referring to is like a dinner party but i think most high volume bartenders deal with this problem every night right exactly so you know it's just something to keep in the back of your mind is just kind of maximize every single step um it's something that chefs in the kitchen are very very familiar with yeah um you know the less cutting they have to do so they'll get very creative on how they cut certain things to maximize you know their movements yeah so you're going to want to think through all the cocktails that you're making and find similar ingredients find similar processes and I would assume you probably want to build all your cocktails first before you add the ice, like in a shaker tin. Right, yeah. Or a mixing or glass. Mixing, and then, you know, while you're shaking, the same principles apply. You know, when you're shaking two different cocktails, obviously you're doing one in each hand. Stir with your toes. Stir with your toes or, you know. And maybe train your dog to get the fourth cocktail. That's absolutely what you need to be doing. Problem solved, Antonine. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. And send us some <laughs> chartreuse, would you? You're killing me over there, Antonine. <laughs> It's true. It's true. 
So the next question is from Merv from Santa Rosa. And actually, Santa Rosa, if he's referring to the one near us, is a town, what, just an hour away from us, I think, up in wine country, California. Yeah, actually, that's where I got one of my first jobs as a craft bar before craft cocktails were famous or kind of in vogue. Yeah, so. So Merv, you are are in a place of history. (laughs) I don't know if that's good or bad. There's a lot of There's a reason we're not mentioning the restaurant name. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So Merv's question is, I think a really fun one. His question is, how do you infuse orange into brandy to make Grand Marnier? And this is a absolutely fantastic question, Merv. We Um, should do this. I think we're going to have to do that. I think we're going to have to. Ooh. I know. Grand Marnier for everyone. Uh, I know. (laughs) So when you think about Grand Marnier, there's a couple things that really come to mind. You have that orange component to it, and you have a really dense or kind of weighty liquid with all the sugar as well. So there's a couple different ways that you can go about this to kind of get that Grand Marnier profile. The first one is just to do a simple infusion of brandy and orange peels, you know, take all the white pith off of it, infuse all the um, peels in brandy, and then add a bunch of sugar and water, simple syrup. So this process is almost the same as when you made limoncello. It's a liqueur. Yeah. Oh, wow. So actually, we do have we do have have a video video on on how to do that. So I will include that in the show notes, which is at mixologytalk.com slash what is this, 53? I think it's 53. I think now. it's 53. Um, but, so I'll include that video. Yeah, it's it's very, very similar. Yeah, it, I mean, it's almost exactly the same thing. I mean, with the actual product of Grand Marnier, there, there's a whole different process that happens with that. I'm sure there's, there's leprechauns involved. Little French leprechauns, absolutely. <laughs> but like I said, there's a couple different ways to do that. That is one way to do it. The other way to do it is actually do a kind of a multi-part infusion, or first you're infusing with orange peels, into the Grand Marnier, and then... Into the brandy? Into the brandy, yeah. sorry. Is Grand um, Marnier made with brandy? I, yes, I actually, assume it's a so. cognac base. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, from my understanding, it's a cognac base, if I'm remembering correctly. Same thing with Cointreau, if I'm not mistaken. Makes sense, um, French and all. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, first part is to do an infusion with orange peels. The second part would be to make a what is called an oleosaccharum with sugar and orange peels. Basically, it's just orange peels... And sugar, I think we made a it's video It's kind of this. like macerating the orange peels. Right, and what it does, it actually extracts all the liquid out of the peel, imparts it into the sugar. So what you're left with is this really kind of oily, sweetened sugar. Uh, we did a video on this, and actually Jeffrey Morgenthaler did a great video or uh, a post on how to make oleosaccharum the easy way. And we'll definitely link to both of those in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. I think oleosaccharum, it sounds really fancy. It sounds really nerdy. It is really nerdy, Mm -hmm. but it's a pretty simple way to really bring out some really intense citrus flavor into your sugar that you're using elsewhere. Right. Absolutely. Since this is a liqueur, you are going to need that sweet element to it. So it's a good way to kind of get a double whammy on the orange flavor. Yeah. And you could try different orange peels, you know, along the whole way and, you know, experiment it with a little bit. So yeah. Definitely have fun. And, you know, uh, Merv, let me know what you come up with. I'd lo- Invite love to us see your over. Re- recipe. Yeah, exactly. And if you're <laughs> working in a bar out. in Santa Rosa, definitely let us know. We'll, uh, we pop up there from time to time. So lo- love to just pop in and uh, have a chat with you. Have a taste. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> so our last question from today is from Jean from Illinois. And her question is, where can I find Takuro mixing glasses in the Uri pattern? Now, it seems like a really straightforward question, but this is actually a little bit more interesting because the real answer is, I think you can't. Let's kind of uh, backtrack a little bit and kind of talk. And for anybody that doesn't understand what she's talking about, we did a post uh, a couple of years ago where I... Long time ago. I I think I bought like six or seven different mixing glasses of different sizes, shapes, manufacturers. This and is such an out. excuse. He, he says, I have to buy all these mixing glasses. It's for, <laughs> it's for a bar above, so therefore it's okay. Actually, it was for, my, for the <laughs> place I was working at because oh. I was so frustrated with all of my Uri mixing glasses shattering. And I mean, like the day I got them in, they would shatter on me when I was using... Oh, no. And this was a common problem probably about four years ago, I want to say, in the in the mixology community where there was one company producing Uri mixing glasses and they were terrible. Yeah. So when you would go through heat, any kind of heat exchange, whether it either be to chill a cocktail down or to warm something up, they would shatter on you. 
unexpectedly not good in a bar that's for sure and the bottoms would just literally fall out of the mixing glasses oh no typically in your ice on the floor it was a really really bad problem on your customers <laughs> exactly and if you look up takuro mixing glasses i think you uh, pulled I it up googled earlier it. this is funny yeah i i googled takuro mixing glass um because i was hoping to find one but the, i think the first result was our review mm-hmm. and the second result was a reddit thread uh that was basically called i hate Mixing glass. I hate your eye mixing, mixing glasses, glasses and all sorts of words that we can't say on a family friend- <laughs> friendly podcast. <laughs> Talking about alcohol, of course. <laughs> yes, exactly. No, that just complaining about how how they just break all the time. Yeah, it was a really bad problem. So Takuro, from my understanding, I called Cocktail Kingdom, who was the uh, the distributor of this particular uh, mixing glass, and they said they discontinued it. And Takuro was the name of the manufacturer. Now your eye is the diamond cut pattern. That's embedded in the glass yeah this is definitely something that confused me i thought your eye was the brand right but it's not it's the pattern it's yeah. like saying that the like a, a shirt is a plaid shirt or houndstooth or something exactly like that. Yeah. yeah so it's the name of the cut design that's actually in the glass there's good news and bad news takuro uh, <laughs> is no longer imported in cocktail kingdom in the united states um, I think they do it in Australia, which is weird. Yeah, any Australians <laughs> out there might be able to find it. Let, let us know. But the quality of your eye mixing glasses has gone up considerably since then. So you don't need to d- to search out the Takuro brand anymore. Right. You're probably going to be okay with most your eye style mixing glasses. Right. And these mixing glasses with the your eye pattern on them have become so pervasive that even uh, places like Bed Bath and Beyond and Wow um what's William Sonoma and all these places have a Uri style mixing glass in their shops that are actually fairly durable so I wouldn't worry about tracking down that particular style or yeah. that particular manufacturer you know just find something that you think looks really nice like I mentioned, the quality of glass has gone up considerably since I made that post. Yeah. So when I did look into it, um, I did not find any Takuro Uri mixing glasses in the U.S., but I did find, what, like five or six of them on Amazon of the Uri pattern that had mm-hmm. great reviews. They were seamless. And you know how people are with Amazon. They're brutal with their reviews. So I think yeah. that uh, it, it's a testament to the fact that you don't need to search out the Takuro anymore. So that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> the moral of the story is, uh, as far as we know, you can't buy Takuro mixing glasses anymore, but you're probably okay with what you can find in Amazon. Yeah, and we'll link to that one particular that has all the great reviews on Amazon in the show notes. So definitely head on over there. And I will say that there are a lot of other alternatives for Uri mixing glasses that we've done a couple different posts. I know you had a lot of fun with one. We Oh, I forgot about yeah. that. So I was, uh, I, I got, I got frustrated with Chris breaking the mixing glasses. So I stomped down to Bed Bath and Beyond or some store like that. And I bought him a French press coffee maker with a plastic insert. Right. And he was so horrified. Chris looked at me like I was crazy. Like, I'm not going to use plastic for my mixing glass. But you know what? It it wasn't bad. It works out really well. And uh, one of the comments we got from uh, Rick Dobbs, who owns uh, last word in Livermore was the fact that if you're using anything like one of those French press coffee, just the the sleeves yeah. or even beakers that they don't have the weight at the bottom. So right. you have to really hold them on because they're going to be uneven. So that That's was a, a great point. comment he made. But I mean, if you're just trying to chill down, you know, a cocktail, you don't need to spend $40 if, if it's just for the home. You, there are a lot of great alternatives beakers are f- well, you can absolutely use, fantastic you can use your shaker tin too right you could use a shaker tin you could use i think you used a, a tupperware shake <laughs> yeah. yeah thing or we've uh, used everything i mean the moral of the story is you're looking to chill down and dilute your cocktail beyond that you don't have to get too crazy you could use a mixing bowl but i do completely agree with the fact that the uri pattern is beautiful and i think it does look really really good on a bar so I'll, yeah i'll absolutely. acknowledge that fact So thank you so much to Antonine, Merv, and Jean for your great questions and for your patience. I know it took us a little while to get to them. We'll be a little bit better about that next time. So if you have questions of your own, I actually added a brand new way for you to send them in. Yes, you can still go to mixologytalk.com slash 53, and there is a button there. But you can also just send us a question directly at questions at mixologytalk.com. Easy peasy. Not much to remember. So if you have any questions about cocktails, mixology, anything at all, definitely send them in. 
And don't forget, there's some good stuff in the show notes this week over at mixology.com slash 53. And by the way, if you're on a smartphone, I think there's a link right in the description of this show. So you can actually click on that. You don't have to type anything at all. We're doing well on the memory stuff this week, aren't we? So definitely check that out. We'll include a video for how to make limoncello, which is what we mentioned when we were talking about making Grand Marnier. And we'll also include a reference for the oleo sacrum as well, which is kind of weird to spell. So not a bad idea to check it out. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. We will see you in a couple weeks. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.